the idea that an energy change in the solar system does not simply refer to an increase in the heat level of the planets or the brightness of the planets or the magnetic field strength, etc., which is the kind of changes that I'm describing in each planet. And if consciousness and energy are interconnected, then quid pro quo, a change in the solar system also refers to a change in consciousness. When one examines the I Ching, the King Wen sequence, what is immediately apparent after only a few minutes of inspection is that it is not simply 64 hexagrams in some random association, but rather that the hexagrams occur in pairs. The second term of each pair is the inversion of the previous hexagram. What this is, is essentially an energy structure drawn out of a mathematical analysis of, uh, of the King Wen sequence. Here is the fractal pattern that is typical of the entire wave. Uh, it happens to show up at, the, at certain levels. And the notion is that throughout the wave, when it is moving downward, novelty, density of connection is increasing. So the general conclusion from these screens is that novelty is being increased and conserved as we move through time. Now, for instance, in this screen, which is further closure with today, we see uh, 562 million years, virtually the entire career of higher life forms on the planet. 8,500 years on the screen, the great proto-Egyptian civilization, Sumer, Ur, Chaldea, are strung out like pearls along this plunge. Egypt culminates that ancient hierarchical uh, form of dominator society. Mycenaean pirates plunder Minoan Crete at this point. At this point, uh, here we have the Periclean Age in Athens. Here we have the Augustinian Age in Rome. Down here we have the Roman collapse and then the oscillating around a mean in a high novelty domain that has characterized time since the fall of the Roman Empire. We are in the last seven years of a 26,000 year cycle. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't hide. You can't get your mama to tell you it's not happening. You can't get scientists to say it doesn't happen unless you can get somebody to move the sky. The Mayans. The Mayans wrote about, described, and carved Neptune in their understanding of the universe and Pluto and Charon and Xena 2600 BC they knew this they wrote it down carved it in stone well we didn't discover Neptune until 1843 we didn't discover Pluto till 1931. We didn't discover Charon until 2001. And we didn't discover Xena until 2003. Explain that to me. Think about it. Where are you going to go if that's true? Whatever you think right now about who you are and where you came from, and that's true, then who are you and where did you come from? And do you believe the history that you've been told? There's a lot of people doing interesting work in the 2012 paradigm. People like John Major Jenkins, people like uh, Jay Widener, people, well, like some of the people that we've assembled here, David Wilcock and David Flynn. But what has been missing is the physics behind those tales. Why was it that the Maya, for instance, were so fixated 
on the center of the Milky Way. How did they even know that the Milky Way galaxy was A, a galaxy, and B, it had a center? If you look at the Milky Way arching across the night sky, it is not readily apparent to the untrained eye that it has a center. It looks like a band of milky light circling the heavens, alternately tipped in one direction and another as the seasons unfold. The Maya knew it had a center. The Vedic tradition, half a world away, literally on the other side of this planet, thousands of years ago, knew the Milky Way was an, an assemblage of stars to which the sun belonged and that we orbited around a center. In fact, they even had the concept that the center of the Milky Way was some incredibly all-encompassing, massive, dark object, i.e. a black hole. And modern science, in the last 10, 20 years, has demonstrated that in fact, yes, a black hole, a dense object, not emitting light, but of intense gravity, something like three or four million times the mass of the sun, lurks at the center of the galaxy. And in fact, in astrology, it is the unsung 800-pound gorilla, or pink elephant, mixing our metaphors madly, in the room. Because in terms of the influence, celestial influences that we now can discuss rationally in terms of the hyperdimensional model, in terms of those influences which influence not only our individual lives, but our collective lives as a people on this planet, it turns out that our geometric relationship to the center of the Milky Way galaxy is of overwhelming importance. And we will be able to demonstrate for you in a very elegant and very visual way that that geometric relationship to the galaxy which comes to a penultimate climax at 11.11 a.m. December 21, 2012 is in fact a physically meaningful relationship and is behind, quite likely, all of the mythos that the Vedas and the Mayas and the Egyptians and the others have given us down through the centuries and thousands of years. What I discovered, in a nutshell, is that there is this very rare astronomical alignment that's happening. In the years around 2012, we might think of a 36-year window. And it's, it's not just some random assortment of planets in a certain sign or something. It actually has to do with the entire framework of the sky. And it's called a galactic alignment. It's referred to as a galactic alignment. It's a, it's a real thing. It's a real empirical thing. Astronomers have calculated it. It happens only once every 26,000 years. And from the vantage point of the Earth, we will be lining up with the center of the Milky Way galaxy, the center of our Milky Way. And this happens only once every 26,000 years. The Mayans give us, in the Western world, the greatest opportunity to see the changing face in time because they were obsessed with it. Because in time, the Mayans created calendars that were so accurate that they rival any calendar and they're more precise than any calendar that we've created in our entire history. The Mayans invented the zero. The zero. Western consciousness didn't discover the zero for another thousand years. And the Mayans invented the zero because they needed to calculate the procession of planets as they moved so that they could build buildings that would be celebrations of events 800 to 1,000 years into the future. You know when we learned how to do that? Sometime in the 70s. And we had calculators and computers and telescopes. They didn't have any of that, so it said. The Mayans say that December 21st, 2012, that's when the cycle closes. What cycle? Okay. The 5,125 year cycle of history, 26,000 year cycle of the, the sun going around, the earth going around the, uh, the ecliptic, 
an even larger cycle, 104,000 year cycle. All these cycles are coming to an end. We are living in a really, really powerful, momentous event in time at this moment. One wonders if there really is some empirical, uh, scientific, energetic sort of uh, basis uh, to this galactic alignment. You know, we're lining up with the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, I've really encouraged scientists and astronomers to look at this. And I really do believe that it probably can form the basis of sort of a new, uh, a new model of consciousness and changes going on on this planet. This, you know, you have to look at this. The minds were in the new world, and, and the old world was, uh, was dominated by the Babylonian civilization and the Babylonian concepts of time, which are based on 12. The Mayan concept is based on 13. Before history, most people used a 13-month calendar. The Mayan prophecy that I decoded, the prophecy of Pakal Votan, who was buried in the tomb at Palenque, says that the, the, the means of uh, changing the time is to, to go from the Gregorian 12-month calendar to go to the perfect harmonic perpetual 13-month, 28-day calendar. The Mayans used that calendar among other calendars. The Aztecs used that calendar. Uh, the Druids used that calendar. The Incas of South America used that calendar. It's the universal calendar. <clears throat> and the point is to make it to 2012 with the, in peace and harmony, the message is we have to change the time. You change the time by changing the calendar. You change, when you change the calendar, you change the program. Like the Gregorian calendar program is full of static and chaos, confusion, injustice, oppression, all of that stuff, inequality. And if we change that, we go to a calendar that is perfectly harmonic, perfectly perpetual. Every, every month is 28 days. Every month has four perfect weeks. Every month starts on Sunday and ends on Saturday. Every year starts on Sunday and ends on Saturday. Then we reintroduce harmony as the fundamental program of our life. In my books, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012 and Galactic Alignment, I did make a really good case for there being an encoded symbolism that, uh, that sort of proves that the Maya did intend 2012 to target this galactic alignment. The Maya, who thrived some 2,000 years ago at this site of Izapa and, and stumbled across this galactic cosmology, this, this galactic cosmovision, are the ones to present us with this model by which we can understand the incredible changes and crises that are going on in the world today. Right now, the human species is the only species that's out of joint. We're, we're totally out of order. We're out of order because we're following a mechanistic time, combined with, which is the clock, combined with the irregular time of the calendar, which creates a, a very crazy-making, accelerating, process. Everyone is experiencing acceleration of time. Everyone is experiencing acceleration of consciousness. It threatens to be a rally cry for indigenous cultures around the world to reassert their self-determination. I mean, if we were to say anything about 2012 in terms of something that might happen in that year or towards the end of that year, because the end date falls on December 21st of 2012, the solstice, uh, we, we might suspect that the Maya and other indigenous cultures that have been, you know, suffering under the iron heel of, of Western uh, capitalism for hundreds of years might uh, rear up and try to take back some of their self-determination. What I look at is the, the actual Maya doc documents, you might say, the, the, the first, the primary documents of, of the Maya tradition. So we have, like, the Maya creation mythology. and it's a world age doctrine, so it talks about a series of world ages, and we are approaching the end of one of those world ages. But the information, the Mayan information in it, is that the end of a cycle is not about a final destruction. It's about a transformation and renewal. The general insight of the Maya prophecy is that at the end of the cycle, uh, 
there's a deity in the creation myth. He's called Seven Macaw, and he exemplifies vain egoism. So this archetype will be seizing humanity, and it'll be controlling and deceiving humanity. And uh, this is the prophecy for the years leading up to 2012. And certainly, I, I certainly wouldn't have to convince you that uh, we look around us and we look at world leaders that are just deceiving and controlling humanity and trying to keep people stuck and uh, limited and keep them unconscious. 